Okay, good evening. Good evening. Right, but thanks so much for coming. This is our first event that we have here, well, first guest speaker event uh, for the last two years. Uh, I'm extremely excited about being back, uh, so much so that I apparently have left my notes down there. All right, uh, it's been an interesting two years since we have met here. The last time uh, world affairs has, of course, changed over the last two years and the basic principles of international relations have been violated and the norms of the liberal world order have come under attack. Um, we need leaders who understand the complexities of the crisis the world is facing. And we need we leaders who are willing to respond rather than message the way out of decisions. Uh, this is why uh, this evening's topic is so timely and important. Even though we don't have as many people as we'd like to have here, we are recording this event. And uh, I'm glad uh, to know that many more people will hear what Mark has to say. Um, please join me in welcoming Mark Polymeropoulos, who will present his work on leadership and apply his expertise to the current situation in Ukraine, and that will be the main focus of today's event. Uh, Mark has uh, a fascinating background and one that equips him well to comment on the current situation. Uh, he has worked uh, for 26 years at the CAA before retiring in July 2019 uh, at the senior intelligence service level. He was one of CIA's most highly decorated operations officers who served in multiple field assignments for the US government. He specialized in counterterrorism, the Middle East and South Asia, including extensive time in Iraq and Afghanistan. Prior to his retirement, Mark served uh, at CIA headquarters and was in charge of CIA's clandestine operations in Europe and Eurasia. He frequently comments on international events in the US media, uh, to, uh, including the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times, uh, GQ, Yahoo, Yahoo, Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC. He also writes a weekly column on intelligence as a Washington Examiner contributor. Uh, Mark is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council specializing on hybrid warfare. He has recently published a book, Clarity in Crisis, Leadership Lessons from the CAA. We have copies of the book here and Mark will be available for uh, book signing after today's event. Um, I would also briefly like to talk about uh, a wonderful organization, a uh, local chapter of the World Affairs Council, uh, which is co-sponsoring this event here. Uh, the, the chapter was established in 2003. Uh, our mission is to raise public awareness of the issues that unite and divide nations, people in major faith communities, and to stimulate interest in a better understanding of important world affairs. We are a volunteers uh, organization. Uh, we work for free, and we happily do so. Uh, membership dues, sponsorships, and grants cover the costs of our programs and general operations. So I would encourage you to consider joining if you're not already a member. Um, if you have any interest, we, I have flyers here, and I'm, I'll be available after the event too. But uh, at this point, uh, once again, please uh, give Mark a warm welcome. And thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be here um, tonight. I'm actually from New Jersey, so I came up, uh, kind of drove through my old uh, uh, haunting grounds, and I got to stop in, I uh, was at Brewster nearby, and I had, uh, I had uh, lunch with a college roommate of mine from Cornell University, so it's wonderful. And this is a gorgeous area here. Um, I love coming and talking uh, uh, about the intelligence community, about CIA, to different audiences all over the country. Um, this is, you know, I almost wish we had kind of a smaller venue where I could sit around a table and talk. So, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm going to make a whole bunch of comments, but I definitely want some interaction, um, some some questions and answers, um, you know, particularly on the current crisis in uh, uh, in Ukraine. But look, I, I will go and I will talk in front of five people or 500 people. I don't care because one of the things that I really believe in um, uh, is is helping the American public, but even internationally, but really the American public understand about what CI is about. Um, it is a uh, uh, an indispensable institution for the United States government. It has had its warts, of course, uh, over the years, but that will be one of the themes I, I talk about today. 
I, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I always start I, every speech, and if you hear me, um, you know, ever again, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I'm on every week on Morning Joe and MSNBC. I won't tell this joke, um, but I do, I do uh, comment when, when I'm introduced to my last name. My last name is Polymeropoulos, but there's a, there's a funny joke here, so bear with me. I was in the Middle East um, back in 2006. I was the deputy station chief, um, and there was, a, there was a crisis going on. I was posted at an embassy. And I got a phone call on our secure line, and it's the President's Daily Briefers. And they're about to go downtown and see George W. Bush, who, you know, we called, obviously, W. And they said, look, Mark, you know, it's really important. You know, ordinarily, there'd be kind of some, some finished analysis, you know, from, from the folks back on the desk on what's happening. But we want to get your take. I've been in that country for a long time. So, you know, can we just talk to you for 10 minutes? We're going to run down to the Oval, and we're going to brief uh, W. And I was pretty excited. You know, that's, you know, as a, as a public servant, you know, I know, like, I, I almost have this direct line to the president. So, so I, you know, I give them my kind of my spiel. They go down. I wait by the secure phone for, you know, for, uh, for several hours. And finally, it's called a green line. Finally, the green line rings. And I said, you know, well, how'd it go? And they said, well, look, the Oval session was amazing. And I said, well, why? What happened? Did he like, did, did, did W, did the president, you know, was he, was he jazzed about what I had to say? And they said, well, actually, he spent the whole time trying to pronounce your last name. So that, that was my claim to fame on, uh, on some time with, uh, with the president. But I, if, you, if you hear me again, I'll, t I'll tell the same joke. Um, so what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership. I wrote a book, obviously, um, and I, you know, I go around the country talking about it. I do a lot of book events. Um, but, I, but I think you know, with what's happening in Ukraine um, and kind of the, the international, uh, uh, you know, the world focused on this, I think I'm gonna, I have a whole bunch of comments um, on what's happening there, really from the intelligence perspective. And then, so I'll talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we, the rest of it can be Q&A. And, you know, you got me for as long as, as we have this room. Um, because really, it's, it is such an incredible and unique time now. Um, and in particular, I think we've been surprised by a lot of things. You know, the, uh, the tenacity of the Ukrainian people, the poor state of the Russian military, um, and of course, the giant questions on what Vladimir Putin's gonna do. Let me just start off a, a little bit about myself. So I, I served 26 years uh, at CIA. Um, I served almost three years uh, in our war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan, so a lot of time away from, from my family. In the last two years of my career, I was the operational chief over Europe and Eurasia, which, of course, includes um, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so I'm not a Russia expert. I was really a Middle East and counterterrorism expert, um, but ultimately I finished my career on, on what is the most uh, you know, important part of the day, uh, part of, uh, uh, you know, or, or the most critical international situation I think we faced in the last several decades. Um, I served under four different presidents, um, so really unique, you know, leadership styles, uh, you know, in terms of what all of them um, were like. You know, there is there is presidents who had an incredible thirst for knowledge um, from you know from from the CIA. You know, we we have something called the President's Daily Brief, the PDB, and that's probably the you know that this is the, the kind of the keys to the kingdom. Every morning, um, this this briefing book is delivered to the senior most policymakers, but it's really designed for the president. Some presidents liked it. Um, you know, George W. Bush, you know, read it as did President Obama. Um, President Trump, uh, uh, you know, kind of preferred more kind of verbal briefings and, and was much more infrequent to the end, end of his time. And, and President Clinton didn't like it at all. And there's a, there's a funny story. Uh, James Woolsey was the CIA director. And, and, you know, during his tenure under President Clinton, a small plane crashed in front of the Oval Office. I don't know if anyone remembers this. And the joke in Washington was, well, that was Woolsey trying to go in to see the president. So, you know, goes tries to crash a plane in there. But, but ultimately, this is a really important document um, that, is, that is kind of the, the, the keys to the kingdom. So, I retired after 26 years, and a couple things kind of stuck with me. One is I realized at the end of my tenure, I was a much better leader. Um, and that goes to kind of one of the key principles in my book, and I'll, and I'll, I'll talk, touch on it a little bit, is that, that leaders are not born, they're really made. And so at the end of my career, I was really good. In the beginning of my career, I was not. And one of the things that you'll see, you know, if you get to know me, and you, you, I mean, I, I do a lot of, you know, media appearances, and, and, and I'm, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm quoted a lot um, in, in kind of print media, um, but if you hear stories like this, you also understand I have a you know, pretty strong sense of humility. Um, you know, there, and, and one of the keys in the book, too, is, is, is overcoming a adversity, because um, it was a tough line, line of business. Um, but, but ultimately, I thought at the end of my career, I wanted to write a book on leadership, um, because I, you know, I learned a thing or two. I, didn't, I, you know, I don't have an MBA. Um, you know, I, don't I'm not gonna, you know I, I give this talk. I give a specific leadership talk to companies all the time. I'll go talk to Google. I go talk to professional sports teams on leadership. Um, but I'm not getting invited by, you know, Harvard Business School because, they, you know, that's not my, my shtick. I still drive a, you know, beat up old pickup truck out there and I gave away all my suits um, when I retired. But this is leadership kind of born from the streets um, of, the, uh, of the Middle East. And I really, you know, I had the honor of doing some great things, but I also kind of had my teeth kicked in along the way. Um, so uh, so the, the, the absolute premise of the book is, 
um, you know, how leaders are, uh, uh, you know, really uh, made in times of crisis. The book's called Clarity in Crisis. So the one thing I'll throw out right away, and, and we'll talk about it a little later on, on Ukraine, is think about um, Ukrainian President Zelensky, who, who was a, literally was the, the, the Ukrainian voice of Paddington the Bear, not only a comic, but Paddington the Bear before this. He had a 30% approval rating before this crisis started. Um, and now he's this Churchill-like figure who has really inspired the world. So, it's, so to me, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, one of the things that I think that we've seen over the last uh, uh, several years, really about a, a country that is, that is divided, um, is that there are people would ask me questions, uh, you know, especially as I, as I go around and talk about leadership, is, um, you, know, you know, where have all the leaders gone? And again, my, my retort is great leaders are made, not born. Um, and, I, you know, I learned that in CIA. Uh, I found myself an adequate leader on most days, you know, a good leader on a select few days, and far more capable towards the end of my career. But again, that, that, um, that improvement only came after uh, much adversity, and, and the failure taught me, taught me very hard lessons on how to, how to lead. So again, I wrote this book. Um, but I do think leadership is, is something that is not taught you know, well enough. Certainly, we teach at our service academies, but, but I don't think there's enough of an emphasis. So I really think we can and we must um, do better. Uh, and really, again, after the last several years of, of partisan turmoil and, you know, uh, an abandonment of democracy by some of our political elite and a pandemic that's killed almost a million of our fellow citizens, I did worry about the state of leadership. Um, you know, do, do we have it, you know, as a community to do, to do better? Um, uh, you know, I, I feared for some time that these concepts of selflessness over selfishness and of doing the right thing, um, which are really ethic, ethics and morals first, you know, which were hallmarks of history's great leaders, they often seem to be missing today. But, but what I'm pleased to say is upon reflection, um, and again, let's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about Zelensky in, in, in a bit, but all is not lost. Um, and, and one of the things I really thought about, you know, you know recently I, I came up with four cases um, where I find uh, hope um, that, again, despite much gloom and doom, there's room for optimism. So, you know, recently I, I went and I gave this speech on leadership to the midshipmen at the U.S. Naval Academy. I did it over a three-hour time period, you know, in, in halls bigger than this when, the, you know, the, the midshipmen would roll in. Um, and, you know, contrary to my belief that I would be in front of some tired and stressed students, the crowd was smart, polite, attentive, they were engaged. And it was really, uh, it was really re uh, remarkable. One young man um, who came up to me at the end of the speech, um, you know, asked me, you know, if I had served uh, alongside U.S. Navy SEALs in Afghanistan. And I said that I had. And he told me his name, and then I realized that his father had been killed in action there. Um, and I was, I was blown away because I was there when this happened. Um, but he still had this unconditional desire to serve his country, and I thought that was remarkable, to help protect his fellow countrymen and, and citizens, even, even after this tragedy that affected him, him deeply. And so, so in my view, as I was thinking about, you know, do we have this, this, this type of strong leadership now? Well, we, well, we do. This aspiring military officer is a leader already, but he might not even know it. Um, even on, on the local level, and you know, I think of, of, you know, one of my good friends, a legendary high school coach in Northern Virginia, um, his name is Mark Pudge Jarman. He's won over 400 games, three state titles, was recently inducted into the National High School uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. Really impressive accomplishments, won a state title last year. Um, but what's, you know, what's his legacy? Is it that? Is it, is, is it those statistics, those numbers? No. It's the leadership he, he provided to hundreds of boys, really turning them into men. Um, he preaches ethics uh, uh, and values that put team above self. Everything you do, you do for the team. Discipline, honor, respect. This guy gets it. He's a leader, local high school baseball coach. So again, that makes me feel that there's some hope for the future. Um, I look back to January 6th. I'm not going to talk about January 6th. It's obviously pretty divisive. But think about the Capitol Hill police officers defending the Capitol that day. And then in particular, there was a former CIA officer, a friend of mine, Representative Abigail Spanberger, who's a congresswoman from Virginia, who she had the training um, uh, to deal with this from her time at CIA. He went, she went to, to members on both sides of the political aisle and asked them to take their pins off. As, as, as the, you know, they were, they were, uh, they were worried that the, the Capitol would be stormed. Um, uh, that's, that's bravery. That's selflessness. So Abigail uh, is, is certainly a, a true leader. Uh, and then most recently, I've been traveling back and forth to Philadelphia, um, where I teach leadership seminars, again, on this book, to the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, I met a captain of the 18th District, Matt Gillespie. You know, he's smart, articulate. He cares deeply for his community. The community is racked by gun violence. Um, he, is, he is part of a profession, obviously under siege, caught between the need for police reform, and he understands that, yet battling this huge uptick in violence nationwide, and so, so Matt is a leader. Um, so these are, these are kind of compelling snapshots, uh, you know, kind of that I thought of my life, and then of course you get to, once again, to President Zelensky, um, who goes on, you know, YouTube, who makes these pleas uh, to, to European parliaments, um, to the United States Congress, who has really mobilized the world, a, a figure, you know, very much like, like Winston Churchill. 
pretty extraordinary and someone who, you know, I think will go down in history as one of the great leaders. Um, so, so really, so, you know, where do we go from here? Um, I, I don't want to just highlight a select few leaders, but you also have to ensure that we're teaching this. So, you know, in my view, and, and again, you know, what, what I preach in the book, there's four fundamentals of great leadership. Um, and that these are the principles that we really have to reinforce. Um, it's not hard, it's pretty basic. Um, you know, first up, great leadership, and I'm not, I'm talking about leadership where, where you do something extraordinary. Um, great leadership is necessarily righteous. One must lead ethically, legally, and morally. You know, one of my heroes at the CI once told me, just do the right thing every time, that's it. Um, great leadership is difficult. Uh, leaders must embrace the tenet of send me. You know, run to the fire, not away from it. You know, when times are tough, step up. One great saying is an airplane always takes off against the wind. So, so in difficult times, you want to be the one to, to raise your hand. And, and again, one of the, my, my, my contentions uh, is that uh, it's much, you know, so anybody can lead when times are easy. When times are tough, it's much different. Great leaders are selfless. That's the idea of, of putting, uh, you know, never ask others to do what you would, you would not do yourself. Always put the group in front of yourself. Um, everything you do is for the benefit of those around you. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I give this leadership speech or, uh, or a leadership speech to tons of sports teams. And obviously, talent wins games and, and teamwork wins championships. And then finally, leadership has to be communicable. And think again about what President Zelensky does all the time. Leadership has to be infectious, but he, he gets on YouTube. He talks to the world. Um, never assume others understand uh, what you don't want, uh, what, what you want from them. You have to communicate and, and be accessible. And then finally, I, I often look to the world of sports to find inspiration. Tim Corbin's the head baseball coach at Vanderbilt University. Um, and, and he hits it out of the ballpark, which is, you know, no pun intended when talking about leadership. And he focuses on team culture. So that, that's another part of it as well. And he says, I think rules are for people who can't follow directions. I think standards are for people who aspire to do special things. So again, high standards. That's what I think we have to uh, demand from our, from our leaders today. Um, let's switch a bit just in terms uh, to, to Ukraine. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to make a couple comments and, then, and, you know, I'll talk for about half an hour and then we'll We'll get into the Q&A, but, but ultimately, you know, Ukraine to me has been, the, you know, the most fascinating international crisis that, I, that I've ever, you know, I, I served 26 years. Um, I retired in 2019, but nothing was like this. This is a land war in Europe, something that, you know, we certainly had planned for during the Cold War, but never saw. Um, but why do we care about Ukraine? And, you know, perhaps why do you care as well? Um, and, and in particular, for, for me, I think Ukraine has generated, garnered, you know, extraordinary emotions amongst many veterans of the U.S., you know, uh, intelligence community and special operations community. It's a classic case of what, of David versus Goliath, good versus evil. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this personally, for me, that was, that was frankly absent in our two decades of, of you know, what, what was nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, there was an absence of moral clarity in those conflicts that I think troubled and haunted many of us um, who saw our friends maimed or killed and have, have had trouble processing the worth of the sacrifices made. Uh, we have all struggled, um, including myself, uh, in, in one form or another. Look, I, you know, I, I was, you know, I, I went into Iraq before the war. I was living up in the Kurds in the mountains. I went in with Naval Special Operations Forces. Um, but ultimately, we participated uh, 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 in a war that rested on false premises, that Iraq, you know, possessed WMD. You can't get away from that. That was an error from the intelligence community. Um, and I'm in Afghanistan as well. Look, I remain intensely proud of our time there and the work we did to degrade Al Qaeda. But, but in my view, we lost our way and st stayed too long. Um, so the last, my point is the last two decades have been a bit messy, um, and there are many scars in this. And that's why I think you see so many U.S. military veterans, so many veterans of the intelligence community, um, you know, even wanting to travel to the Ukraine and fight. I have friends who are there now. I'm too old to go do this, and I think I've put on a couple too many pounds. Um, and I'm not sure it's that wise to do because, you know, the capture by Russian forces is going gonna, is gonna to be a bit of a mess. We're going to, Americans, you know, American military is going to have to go um, potentially rescue, uh, uh, you know, private citizen Americans who are there. But I get their, their, their you know, their, their deep emotional attachment. Um, so really, so Ukraine is in our front sight post. Um, and for, for the reasons, you know, I just stated, it's a conflict that burns really intensely in our desire to make things right. And it really resonates um, with a member of my kind of uh, old crowd. And I'll, and I'll throw one more thing in there as well as, um, and, and again, if you see people like myself um, uh, who are passionate about this, and again, I talk about this on, on, on TV all the time, um, I, th I want to help, I want us to say, I want to see the United States help Ukraine win. Um, because for mem many members of, of, of special operations, the intelligence communities, we spent years across the globe, you know, helping to train, nurture, and fight with indigenous forces or newly established militaries. So this is living side by side. When I was in Afghanistan, there was 20 Americans. I was the base chief there. I lived with 1,000 Afghan indigenous forces for an entire year. Um, so what does that mean? We're relying on them for protection and, and food and shelter. Um, we, of course, were their enablers, bringing unique capabilities, and we, and we fought together. 
So when practicing this unconventional warfare, it comes down to these personal relationships. So whether it's Afghans or Syrians or Iraqis or Somalis, um, but that's what defined you know, my experience. And I think um, uh, you know, they, that sometimes they saw us as our saviors, but in most cases, the end result was, was not what we had hoped for in some of these conflicts. So you, know, you can make an argument, did we win in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, or Somalia? I'm not sure. And now we have Ukraine. And so there's an opportunity, I think, and this is a feeling for a lot of us that Ukraine can be a little bit different. Um, certainly, it's a conflict unlike the last 20 years where we can actually help our, our Ukrainian friends um, prevail. They're fighting fiercely. They're defending their homeland, you know, obviously subject to horrific atrocities. You've seen this uh, in the media. And again, Zelensky is a Churchill-like figure, um, you know, inspiring from the front. Again, talking about leadership, you know, one of the famous, famous quotes that he had when he was offered an exfiltration by the United States when we thought Kiev was going to fall. And what was his famous phrase? He said, I don't need a ride. I need ammo, which, you know. That was a public relations dream. It was brilliant on so many, so many level, uh, levels. Um, you know, you can say, you know, it inspired the world, inspired many of us. You know, my, my friends from Texas keep telling me Ukraine is Texas and Mariupol uh, uh, is the Alamo. Um, it's pretty, pretty uh, appropriate what we'd see what's happening today in, uh, in, in Mariupol. Um, again, I speak to a lot of my colleagues. They wish to be in the fight. Um, and, and, you know, there are times where I certainly wish I was a young CIA case officer, you know, heading off to Europe. Um, I used to tell, when I, when I ran Europe and Eurasia operations, I had thousands of officers under my command. I used to tell them that they had an opportunity both to witness and sometimes make history, and certainly that would be the case now. So I, I, there's, there's a side of me wishes I could still be, st still be in that fight. So one of the things I think we should think about, too, is, you know, uh, imagine those in the special operations and intelligence world, again, my old tribe, that were, were actually involved in the conflict before. We spent eight years in Ukraine before this war kicked off, starting in 2014. The U.S. government was, was pretty heavily involved in helping train the Ukrainians. So imagine that you've been working side by side with your Ukrainian colleagues in, in their national security establishment. So what's going on in your brain today? Something kind of similar to what's going on in mine. Um, you know, we've been with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in this fight. They've battled the Russians for eight years, and they're now in the fight of their lives. Um, we actually have faith in them. You know, there was so much uh, in the press about how, the, you know, Kyiv was going to fall in several days. But talking to, you know, my friends who were certainly involved in the past, they had a lot more faith in, in, in the Ukrainians. Um, I think the U.S. intelligence community got a lot of things right. You know, clearly we somehow um, got a hold of the war plan. So if you remember, you know, we were, we were warning the world the Ukrainians were going to go in. But, but on the other hand, I think our, our military analysts might have uh, certainly overstated the prowess of the Russian military. And I can take some questions on this on this later. Um, but ultimately, what people really thought, you know, as we, as, as, you know, my friends were there in Ukraine for the last eight years, not there now, or not that I can tell you about, um, you know, I don't think they're surprised at the Ukrainian success. Um, and, and certainly, you know, my, the, the, the colleagues I have who were there believe it was the greatest honor and privilege of their careers to have helped them, and they had a lot of pride in this. Um, so really, so the hope, I think, for, for policymakers, at least in my view, is, you know, let us send more weapons. Um, provide more training, provide that tactical intelligence that the Ukrainians need. I think that's happening now. Um, you know, do what we've been doing, but increase on the, on the scale exponentially. Um, you know, there is, of course, you know, there is, there is a worry about escalation. I'll talk about that a, a little bit, too, because I think there's been a great uh, deal of um, uh, uh, worry, of course, uh, about uh, Putin's uh, potential use of tactical nuclear weapons. But I also think that President Biden has done a pretty good job of, of managing that, of kind of finding that sweet spot in terms of you know, how much economic and military pressure um, he can put without that, that worry about escalation. Again, that is Biden acting as a leader. Um, Pre-war, let me just tell you a, a little bit uh, about what I found was, was so interesting. And, I, you know, I call the, like, again, I make a lot of baseball analogies, but I think the intelligence community really did a, hit, hit a home run pre-war. Um, you know, what was done was this use of authorized uh, intelligence disclosures. And so, in essence, the Biden administration, um, and that was really a group led by President Biden, but, but ultimately it was, it was some people I, I personally know, CIA Director Bill Burns. Again, when we talk about um, you know, leadership, he's someone who I, I respect deeply. Um, it was Bill Burns, it was the DNI uh, of Real Haynes and the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan who decided on this policy of, of, of ultimately flooding the zone, of, of authorizing, of downgrading intelligence um, uh, and, uh, and presenting it to the, to, to the world. And you know, this, this, of course, was when obviously we had obtained the war plans. We knew the Ukra uh, Russians were going to invade, and, and we were going to the Euro our European allies and saying, this is going to happen. We were going to the Ukrainians and saying this, is hap this was happening. A lot of people didn't believe us. Um, but it was really a revolution in, in, in thinking. And it was, you know, it, it, there, this is a difference. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, do, don't you remember, and I clearly remember watching, 
uh, you know, probably Colin Powell's worst moment as, as Secretary of State when he was at the UN making the, the case for war um, in terms of presenting US intelligence, which was faulty. But, but in this case in Ukraine, it was totally different. Um, these deliberate disclosures um, uh, were designed to stop a war, not certainly to promote one. And I think that's a, that's a huge difference uh, as well. So I don't find that uh, to be a relevant um, uh, uh, comparison. You know, these disclosures are also not leaks. This was authorized. Again, a lot different in terms of what things were happening um, uh, in the past. And what did it do? You know, it was ultimately the thought was to get in Vladimir Putin's head to kind of get through, get into his d decision cycle, and perhaps dissuade him from invading. That didn't work, um, and that was unfortunate. But but really, the, the 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 bigger effect was to rally our European allies, and that really did help. Um, and that that has, that should be highlighted again. It was leadership. From, from national security practitioners like Bill Burns, like Jake Sullivan and Avril Haines. So while it didn't deter uh, Putin, it certainly bolster, bolstered and helped rally, helped, excuse me, helped rally our, our NATO allies by ultimately exposing what the Russians were going to do. This was a sea change in thinking in the intelligence community. Um, in 2014, when Russia annexed uh, Crimea, and in 2016, when, when Russia really was interfering in US elections, the intelligence community had, had, had collected a tremendous amount of information, but there was huge reticence and reluctance to allow uh, policymakers to operationalize it, to, to publicize it. So I think we certainly learned from that. Um, again, when Russia invaded, uh, it was clear that the IC, uh, predict, the intelligence community predictions, um, uh, it, you know, we got it right. Um, one thing on this, just as a note, you know, as, you know, as, a, as I talk to kind of audiences around the country, what's missed in this discussion is that, that while we, we did predict uh, uh, the, the Russian invasion, that's really not the job of intelligence. Intelligence doesn't have to be predictive. Um, it's not the IC's place to tell policymakers the time and place of an event. Um, if, and, and if it's collected that way, it's outstanding, and that's what happened. But intelligence, when it's done right, um, is designed to avoid surprise. And so, you know, in this case, um, uh, the, the intelligence community early on began providing policymakers that an assessment, uh, with an assessment that Putin may do this. And he, of course, he did invade. But the whole point is even, just that warning was enough. That's what intelligence is. It's, it's a warning function. Um, so again, you know, kind of where do we go from here? Uh, and, and events have changed on the ground every day, but, but a couple things. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we have to prepare, we had to prepare for the worst, which would be a, an insurgency, a Ukrainian insurgency. Now, it looks like Kyiv is not going to fall. Um, but make no mistake, the intelligence community, the CIA, along with the U.S. military and special operations forces, um, you know, this is what, you know, this is what we do. Uh, there's an organization called SOCIR, Special Operations Command Europe. Um, you know, their entire existence for 70 years was to help prepare Europe for, a, for, for what was a, a Soviet uh, invasion. But, um, uh, but again, you know, the, the idea of, uh, of, of uh, uh, supporting insurgencies is something built in our DNA. And so I think we're in good shape, um, you know, with that as well. Uh, we're, the U intelligence community is going to really look very closely that signs that Putin's regime is cracking. You look at Putin's leadership and how abysmal it has been. Um, I think, you know, there, there are several fundamental uh, elements that, that uh, where, where Vladimir Putin, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, obtains his power and, and the power source. One is the security services. He's a former, of course, former KGB officer. So we're going to take a look at, at you, know, you know, what is happening with the security services. I think uh, about a week ago, there was 150 FSB, their internal security services, uh, service, 150 of their officers who were purged. That's a really interesting data point. We have to see if that goes. Um, secondarily, the oligarchs around him, we want to see if they're if they're fleeing, and then finally we're, going to, we're obviously going to take a look at kind of organic protests in the streets. Um, I don't think there's anything that that suggests right now that Putin's in trouble, but it's certainly something um, that that we're going to be uh, to be looking at. I think at this point now it, we're on week eight of the war, and so you know with really watching you know heroic Ukrainian efforts to counter the brutal Russian invasion. So you know I've certainly watched this with a sense of horror at the Russian atrocities and, and, and pride, in fact. In, in, in the West, I mean, if, if you take a look at some of the leaders, um, I think President Biden has done a very good job. You, you take a look at, uh, uh, obviously, President, President Zelensky, but even and when you take a look at Germany, uh, in a country which has, has almost dramatically changed overnight, um, where now the Germans are talking about spending much more on, uh, uh, on, on defense, actually sending weapons. We even have the German Green Party talking about the need of, uh, you know, in, in order to, to kind of get off the... Uh, the, the reliance on, on Russian oil and gas. The German Green Party is talking about the need for nuclear power. Pretty extraordinary. So German leadership, I think, has been something that has been, has been noteworthy. Um, one of the things that we have, uh, 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 that, that goes, I think, um, without, without being seen in, in the public light is the, are the intelligence wars. 
Um, and I think, I don't know if anyone has seen uh, about, what, about 10 days ago, there was expulsion of about 400 Russian, uh, Russian diplomats from Europe. Um, this is an extraordinary development. This is Russian intelligence officers who were serving in Europe. For a long time, Europe was their playground. Um, they've wrecked havoc in Europe. Uh, it, to include election interference in multiple countries, both successful and unsuccessful assassination operations. And so, again, under the leadership of, uh, uh, of you know, uh, the NATO allies, um, there has been uh, uh, an incredible purge of Russian intelligence officers from Europe, and I think that is outstanding. I also wouldn't be surprised if, you know, before they were leaving, they would have a friendly chat um, prior to their departure from, from, you know, our intelligence officers. Because after all, think about if you're a Russian official, you get kicked out of Europe. It was a place where you were enjoying kind of the fruits of, of living on the continent, and you have to go back to a country, you have to go back to Moscow, which is, you know, turning into, which is isolated. It's turning into North Korea, um, economy in tatters. And so hopefully, you know, my old colleagues in the intelligence services um, are, uh, are, 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 you know, having friendly chats with them, maybe trying to get them to work for us or, or perhaps to defect. Um, I always say for an allied case officer, for an operations officer, CI officer in Europe right now, it's probably, you know, prime hunting season on Russians. Uh, and, then, and then I think that we also have to talk about these days of the notion that, that certainly wasn't, you know, again, I said we're on week eight, but um, the notion now that UK, Ukraine can actually win, and it's okay to say that. Um, I think when, you know, if you had said that eight, eight weeks ago, people would have thought you were crazy. Um, and, and what does that mean? R Ukraine actually can eject uh, Russia from all the lands that, that uh, they're occupying, including in the Donbass. Um, and that would be with increased allied assistance, um, and that certainly can happen. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, I don't think we've hit that sweet spot um, of maximum economic and military pressure. Um, that would not lead to, uh, uh, you know, escalation and a, and a military confrontation um, uh, with NATO. And, and we're doing things now, such as supplying Ukraine with multiple launch, uh, uh, multiple launch rocket systems, um, anti-ship missiles, and you saw kind of an extraordinary development uh, about a week ago when um, uh, the Ukrainians using their own indigenous anti-ship missile uh, took out um, kind of the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, which is extraordinary. Um, and even, even today, you know, there was reports, there was a whole notion in the past of should we supply um, uh, uh, the Ukrainians with MiGs, with MiG-29s, and that was kind of shot down. Well, uh, uh, Admiral Kirby, the Pre Pentagon press spokesman, um, I think it was just yesterday or maybe this morning, said that that actually is happening now. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty extraordinary, um, and I think we, should, we certainly should do more. Um, there's a sense uh, uh, I get sometimes on this um, that there, there is a crowd in the foreign policy community um, that says just do enough. And so that's the idea of just pushing the Ukrainians or just providing them enough assistance, you know, perhaps to, to do better uh, on the negotiating table, um, but not to give them the, the, you know, the, the tools when they have to win. And I saw this happen in Syria. When I was in, in uh, our deputy ops chief in the, in, in the Middle East, where U.S. officials in public actually admitted that they wanted to provide the Syrian opposition with just enough military support um, to go to the negotiating table, but not to win, and I found that to be, to be immoral. And I think that um, that thinking, which, which, you know, which does exist uh, in some elements in the National Security Council now, I think that's going away. Um, I think they are trying to, um, to, to help, uh, uh, certainly help uh, uh, Ukraine um, win in the end. Um, Couple more points. Uh, that, oops, sorry, that I want to make. The million dollar question that everyone's talking about is will Putin go nuclear? Something that, uh, that I think CI Director Bill Burns in a speech on April 14th at Georgia Tech um, warned about this. And again, uh, Director Burns, who is, is probably the most uh, you know, prominent member of, of Biden's national security uh, uh, team, um, and he knows Putin about as well as anyone uh, uh, in the US government having served as ambassador in Moscow. Um, you know, when, he's, when he talks, when he makes that warning, we certainly should heed that uh, and listen to what he has to say. Um, you know, a Putin backed into the corner, desperate, angry, and humiliated, you know, that's something we have to, uh, uh, we have to take into a, a account. Um, but I don't think it means, and I don't think he meant, that we have to take our foot off the gas, because again, we still haven't kind of gotten to that maximum economic and military pressure. And Zelensky knows this too, and he actually has warned about, uh, that he, or he's worried about Putin's use of, of tactical nukes. Um, so what do we do on this? And, and again, this is, this is something that, that, you know, is being talked about today, uh, certainly in Washington, but, but all over in the media. Well, first and foremost, we have to, we have to f uh, focus our intelligence collection, um, monitoring the Russian military units that would employ tactical nukes. Um, you know, that would be, you know, air, sea, and land units. And so our, the intelligence community is looking at this very closely now. And in fact, um, there's a report I just saw on CNN that, that, uh, that uh, Secretary of Defense Austin is meeting with, um, you know, his top kind of nuclear 
uh, officials on this. But if, but if we do see that movement, and we haven't yet, and Bill Burns was very clear on that, I think you're gonna go back and seeing these authorized intelligence disclosures again to, to kick in, and, and why is that? So you're gonna have you know, President Biden, and you're gonna have uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan, and, um, and, and, and probably uh, 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 Lloyd Austin as well, Secretary of Defense, they're gonna come out and they're gonna talk about this, because what does this do? It provides a warning to Putin that we know what he's up to. Um, uh, uh, but, but a couple other things. One, it, the other is that it, it's, it provides a, a mechanism to warn China. And in my view, President Xi um, certainly does not want to see Putin go down this road. I think China can, can play actually an effective uh, role here in putting pressure on, on Putin not to do this. Um, and then there's going to be, me this is messaging also the Russian military, saying that you know, we know who, which command and control units um, are there and that if you do this, you are committing war crimes. And I think that's, that's uh, really important. Um, we'll go ahead with things we call information operations. You know, we have the ability, so it's not a secret, you know, the, you know, the Ukrainians have collected literally the cell phone numbers of every Russian military member in Ukraine today. They have the ability to message them on their cell phones. They've done that effectively. Well, we'll start seeing them message that same theme, but if, if we see the, the potential use of tactical nukes, that everyone involved on the Russian side is a potential uh, uh, war criminal. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of close with, with one thing here about war crimes itself. I remember when I was in Iraq in 2003, digging up mass graves upon our infiltration um, uh, uh, in, in April 03, and this is Saddam Hussein, you know, committed terrible atrocities, particularly against the Iraq, uh, Iraqi Shia. But in one, what haunted me was not the bones, you know, or the skulls uh, that I saw, and it wasn't the smell, but it was the villagers coming out, the actual people, and they remembered, and they told the stories. And so make no mistake, the Russians have committed really atrocious war crimes. Um, we're documenting it. The intelligence community has been a task to do that, uh, as has uh, certainly uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. So what we're, where we're now is awful. The employment of a tactical nuke would make anything we see now look like child's play. Um, but one day this war will end, um, but we can't let Putin and his military get off the hook. So I think aggressively pursuing war crimes um, will be paramount, both ensuring accountability, but, but even now also as a deterrent as we message uh, the Russians who would be involved in this. Because uh, ultimately, in the, in the end, you know, this war will end, but there has to be a reckoning um, for those Russians who committed those, those atrocities. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now. Chatted for exactly 40, 40 minutes or so. Um, it could be on Ukraine. The other thing, you know, I, was, I was involved in counterterrorism operations. I spent a lot of time in Iraq and Afghanistan. We can talk leadership, but I'm happy to take questions. It's great to be here. I love talking about, again, you know, talking about the CIA uh, to the American people is really important. It's an in, you know, indispensable institution. We've had our warts. Um, I get, and, and I'm sure there'll be a question here, I get every time I do this, I talk to college students once a week all over the country. Everyone always asks me about enhanced interrogation or torture, so I'm sure I'll get a question um, to that. It's not funny, but I'll get a question on that. Um, any question is, uh, is uh, it, there's nothing out of bounds. Um, but thanks so much for coming, coming tonight, and fire away. So, so, I've, so what a great question, and I've changed my, well, first of all, everybody got it wrong. So, so myself, anyone else who thinks they're smart on this thought the Russians would, um, you know, roll into Kyiv and take the city within an hour. So, so it, it just whatever I say, just realize we've been completely wrong on this uh, uh, before. But, but I've changed uh, my mind on this quite simply. I think, the, I think the Ukrainians, when I say win, that's a terrible statement to say because of the incredible human carnage that has occurred. But I think they're going to prevail. Um, I think you know, it, what, you know, we certainly, you know, we didn't, we didn't uh, take into account enough the, the you know, kind of the spirit um, and the drive of the Ukrainian people. But there's another key part of this why I think Ukraine um, can prevail in this because uh, right, right now the whole fight is in the east in the Donbass, and it's much more kind of traditional land campaign. We're going to see obviously tank battles reminiscent of World War II. Um, but but for eight years, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine has been has been fighting uh, Russian separatists and the Russians in this area. And, and so one of the things, and I'll you know, share just you know, something with you. When I, was, when I would talk to you know, uh, US forces who would come back um, you know, during this eight year period, when we were training the Ukrainians, they would say to me, they said, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a laboratory experiment on watching the Russian military. And so for eight years, we watched Russia use all of its advanced um, hardware techniques, everything. And the Ukrainians learned. And so you know, I think it's gonna be really bloody um, but I think the Ukrainians will prevail, and, and ultimately, um, you know, Vladimir Putin's going to be humiliated, and, you know, the off-ramp is going to be, I think, um, that he withdraws, and likely, 
you know, you know the, I, think, I think the international community has to be very careful. He shouldn't be rewarded with anything, but the performance of his military and his intelligence services has been so bad that that's his, that's his scapegoat. And he'll be able to tell the Russian people, um, you know, you know, you know the, the Russian military failed me. We already, we already have seen purges in the military. We saw purges in the FSB. Um, uh, but I think, you know, Ukraine has a chance to, to, to prevail here. I, I hate to use the word win because what's happening there is so awful. But um, I've changed my mind on this, and I, 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 think, I think that uh, um, they, uh, they certainly have a shot. And, and, and make, look, we're also pouring in weapons right now. Um, and these are not stingers or javelins, what we did before. This is, you know, artillery systems and helicopters. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, the, the, the more advanced weaponry is coming in, which is really going to help them. Ah, yeah. So I know the traditional weapons that we have provided to them. So you know, it was, it was, uh, so uh, I was on Morning Joe yesterday, and they asked me, and Joe Scarborough asked me this question, or one of them asked me this exact question, and, and I'll give you the same exact answer. Um, so there was there was great fear about Russian cyber warfare capabilities. And one of the things I do at the Atlantic Council is I look at hybrid warfare, and, and cyber is part of this. But there was there was great fear that the Russians would um, do things like they did in the past when they had, you know, they kind of took down the Ukrainian power grid. Uh, but um, there's a couple things. One is I get the sense that that U.S. Cyber Command, the United States, has helped Ukrainians tremendously, and so we're not seeing that happen because of the the the, the, the things we have done that are just not out in the public. Um, and then, and the second part of that is, Russia is, is successful and was successful when our defenses were down. So it's not that they are so good at this, and, and they're pretty good. Um, but when when they w would undertake kind of these uh, uh, these cyber attacks, it's, you know, the United States was not prepared. So I think we also have done uh, a tremendous tremendous amount. I have a friend uh, who was telling me just this morning. He wrote me a text talking about, you know, Department of Treasury here in the United States. You know, our cyber you know uh, uh, defenses in terms of kind of core infrastructure is really up, um, and so. Uh, I, I think that, you know, while there has been some questions on why hasn't Russia done this, I think the real answer will come out eventually in the public is that it's because, you know, we thwarted them. Um, and that Cyber Command and, and the National Security Agency, and of course all of our, our allies and our partners and in, in, in Ukrainians are good, um, that they also had a, had a much more of a defensive shield up. Uh, because th there, there can be no other explanation. Um, the other explanation is that the Russians just didn't decide to do it, but I find that hard to, Hard to believe now because of you know I mean they are they are losing and losing badly in this campaign. Great question. And so I don't know, on, on a personal level, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think, you know, so President Trump was, was unpredictable to kind of an extreme. Um, uh, but, but I think what you're saying, uh, you know, makes some sense in that President Biden, you know, from the outset, um, really took something off the table that I think that while no, there's no support in the United States for this whatsoever. Um, but I don't know if we, he should have announced it publicly. So, so in, in some way, I kind of agree with you on that. Uh, uh, one of the things that makes this unpredictable, though, that, you know, using your word, is um, you know, events on the ground really do drive what occurs. And one of the things that I found remarkable, again, as someone I was overseeing you know, our, our operations in Europe, um, uh, European attitudes has changed dramatically on this. You now have you know, the Europeans, or, or you know, the, 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 the Finns and the Swedes, the, European, the, the publics there want to join NATO. Pretty extraordinary. Um, I think that the, the atrocities on the ground have shocked people so much that attitudes in Europe um, certainly shifted in terms of helping uh, 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 the Ukrainians more. Now, the wild card on this, and it, it applies to the United States as well, is I think if the Russians use chemical weapons or, God forbid, a tactical nuclear weapon, I think that the, there will be a, a, a tremendous drive for NATO to actually to intervene, including the United States. Um, uh, and so. I think ultimately, you know, the, the, the core of your question is, should Biden have said things like, we will never put boots on the ground? I, I, th I don't think so. And I think a lot of us in the weird, you know, foreign policy blob who comment on everything when we're retired, 
um, uh, you know, you know, really weren't supportive, wasn't supportive of that. Um, but but you also understand why, um, because Biden had to had to you know generate support for the American people for, even for just the level of intervention. And you have to remember, in the United States, um, you know, so I live in this weird bubble in Washington D.C. And we always joke the foreign policy blob, and so we comment on everything. But you know, the, you know America is, is certainly a, you know it's a, a hell of a big country, and I think a lot of people are tired um, with kind of our you know, our foreign entanglements, um, and which is why I think that the Biden administration has done a very good job on getting to us where we are. And so you know, a lot of times you hear people on both sides of the aisle saying that you know we wish the United States had, could do more. Um, I think they have done you know, and and, and we've done a pretty damn good job, and we also have let, in many occasions, let the Europeans lead, and that's okay, because this is on the European continent. Um, and really, there is there is a tectonic shift in Europe that has occurred with the Ukraine crisis. It's extraordinary. Um, and so, uh, so I, I, I think that, that you, know, you know, Biden has hit that, that, that right, right sweet spot, but events on the ground. I mean, so, so, it literally, so if Vladimir Putin, if they detonate a tactical nuclear weapon, all bets are off. Um, uh, and so, you know, that is, and that is, that's why, as I was, I was, I was saying before, everything is being done possible for that not to happen. Well, I mean, so you, you're talking about why would Putin do this? Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, there, there is, there, you know, there, but, but the, I think what, what Bill Burns was warning about the other day is, um, you know, Vladimir Putin is, is angry. He is humiliated. Um, uh, and, and, you know, he's, he's, he's backed into a corner. So, so the, the question is, you know, is, does he get to a spot where he does something which shouldn't necessarily be rational? Um, and so I think that is, the, that is the worry because just, you know, I, I, on the face of it, uh, the only thing that he would get out of this, if he, if, in, in my view, is if, if he employed a tactical nuclear weapon, would, would immediately the Ukraine, would, would, that would force the Ukrainians perhaps to immediately, in essence, sue for peace. Um, but again, that's, you know, that, that, that you, you have, and, and these, it's a, you know, it's a low-yield nuclear weapon. I'm not an expert on this. Former Secretary of you know, Defense Jim, James Mattis always talked about, you know, there's no difference between a tactical, between tactical and strategic nuclear weapons if you go over that threshold. But, um, uh, but but ultimately, you know, there's there the, that would be the Russian thinking is that the, that's their kind of last desperate attempt um, to to kind of push the Ukrainians to the negotiating table, uh, and and we're in a different world when this happens, um, you know, you know the kind of the, the found ever since you know the, the, the you know ever since the, you know Hiroshima the foundations of of security have been based on 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 deterring this, so it's it's this is this is uh, this is pretty scary times, sorry. Right. So you're right. So so I think you know the but so the answer is yes. So they're they're obviously German Germany has been pressured to do a lot of things they weren't willing to do before, but they still are not willing to to you know for for in, in their view um, you know the threat of a major recession to kind of get off the dependence of Russian oil and gas. Um, but there is something kind of kind of you know in my view gross and immoral about the fact that we're, you know we're in essence fighting a proxy war against the Russians, yet we're also sending you know, a hell of a lot of money to the Russians. Um, I, I think that the, the argument in Germany is that it, it will take them time to, 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 you know, to get off their dependence. Um, something drastic would be too much of a shock. Um, and I think political polling in Germany is not clear on this as well. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but, but you know, ultimately, I, you know, I think you know, there, is, there is something to be said. It, it, it's more, it, for me, um, I think the Biden administration has been uh, understanding, you know, greatly so on, on, on these concerns. Um, uh, it's more kind of in the long term uh, because for a lot of us warned, the uh, Europeans and particularly the Germans, uh, the French and the Italians, that their dependence on Russia um, was too great. And, and you know, it, it comes home to roost now. I mean, the, the, uh, you know, there, there was an idea and, and uh, uh, you know, Angela Merkel really was the promotion of this idea um, that, that Russia could be integrated um, uh, into the into into Europe, as as is uh, uh, President Macron in France. You know, almost still kind of clings to this hope. Um, I think that is going away, um, and particularly with the war crimes. Uh, you know, so I, so I think you know at, at this point, you know, you know, there's there's no kind of turning turning back um, for for Putin. But um, 
the, 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 the notion of, uh, you know, getting out of this dependent relationship uh, with Russia. I think that has taken hold in Europe. Um, it's certainly going to take some time. And in Germany's case, they're not willing to take that kind of drastic measure, which would be the right moral measure. There, you know, I, I read something, um, Ian Bremer, uh, Bremer who's, uh, who comments a lot in the media, at, at a great point, he said, if, if and as, as we all kind of like to gang up on Germany on this, and, you know, in, in some instance, fairly, uh, it was, with, with some um, justification, but what if it was the United States? What if we were entirely dependent on Russian oil and gas? Um, would we take a step that would send our country into total recession? I don't know. And I'm not sure about what American attitudes would be towards that, despite the morality part of it. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, no, the Green Party has announced their, that they are actually in favor of this. So I think, you know, attitudes in Germany have, have been dr have drastically changed. Um, now, now it's, it, this is all talk. Um, and, and I saw even, even President Biden uh, the other day started talking, uh, started talking, uh, there, there was some move meant, uh, made to um, reopen, regenerate, do something with the U.S. nuclear plants. But that's, I mean, you know, there, you know there's, there's no choice that's going to be perfect. Um, it's obvious that dependence on Russian oil and gas is, is cannot be uh, it cannot be sustained in the future. No, so, so the, the, and, you know, this is the kind of the, the million dollar question. And, the, you know, the idea that there's this silver bullet like that, I think everyone would hope for that, frankly. Um, uh, but, I'm, but I'm not sure we are there just yet. And what, so, you see, I mean, when you take a look at the Russian military, it's really interesting. So they embarked on this incredible modernization program, but in fact, it was, a, it was, it was you know, rife with corruption. Um, the Russian military senior leaders got very rich, uh, you know, you know and, and certainly as you see from their performance. Um, uh, you know, nothing came even close to what was expected of them. So, so what does this mean? So it becomes interesting from an intelligence perspective if Vladimir Putin starts really scapegoating the military. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, uh, there is a sense, um, you know, that, that this might happen. Uh, you know, obviously there's a new, you know, a new uh, you know, Russian general in charge um, now, you know, the, the former butcher of, of Damascus, of, 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 sorry, the butcher of Aleppo. Um, so, uh, uh, I think that's, you know, one of the things we're, we're really monitoring. Um, if you see Putin starting to scapegoat uh, the, the military like he has done uh, the FSB, I think that would be, that would be something that, as, as you take a look at kind of Russian military leaders. And, and you know, the other part of this, too, is, um, uh, so, you know, we, we talk about this in a vacuum, but the fact of the matter is we can't get away from it that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal, but so, so is the Russian military, even, you know, his senior commanders down to soldiers. And, you know, I have, I have, you know, lots of friends who are, you know, truly really true Russian experts. One of them is Julia Yaffe, who's, uh, you know, uh, you know who's, who's ethnic Russian. Um, she's on TV all the time, has written a, you know, a whole bunch of books on this. Um, but one of the things that I think has bothered a lot of people is, you know, why are Russian soldiers doing this? Um, you know, there is a, it is a systematic, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, uh, Almost unprecedented use of, of, of you know violence, intimidation, rape. Um, what they're what they're doing to the Ukrainian people, you know, uh, as a tactic is abhorrent. Um, so it's this is not Vladimir Putin just just you know you know as solely responsible. It's also why why the, why these Russian you know boys, generally because they're going to be really young. Why are they doing this? Um, you know, and and is it, and and there's also a sense now that these are this is sanctioned by the by the Russian military leadership as part of their strategy of kind of violence of, of intimidating the population. So, um, you know, I, I, I you know I, I wonder if there's kind of any good guys left, uh, you know, amongst the uh, amongst the Russian military elite because you know what they've done I think is is been so barbaric. I think it's shocked a lot of us. This is I mean this you know it, you know this is just it's 2022 and and you know war is a terrible thing. 
there are rules and, and norms uh, in war that are generally followed. Um, the Russians are certainly not doing that. No, no, you know that's a, that is. A, I, I think that um, you know. So, so this is this course of time when Biden was vice president, um, and, and so it's you know it's and, and so this is uh, this is under Obama. Um, uh, I think that uh, you know one of the one of the the things the United States is not good at multitasking when it comes to conflict. And if you think back to 2014, you know we're we already you know we're still embroiled. You have Iraq, Afghanistan, you have Syria, kind of brewing, and then this happens, you know, in, in Ukraine with the annexation, uh, 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 with the annexation of Crimea. Um, it's pretty clear to everyone involved we didn't do enough um, uh, uh, at that time. And so, you know, did, did Biden grow as a leader? Well, sure. Um, but I think, you know, it just, I think it's, it's that experience uh, that, uh, you know, and, and, and how we have seen that kind of, you know, Russian malfeasance has never been challenged. And so whether it's the annexation, I mean, you can go back to, you know, the, the annexation of, of Crimea, you can talk about, you know, the Russian sea, uh, the Russian, you know, incredible siege of, of Aleppo, where the Russian Air Force killed 4,000 Syrian civilians. Um, and, and there's not a peep, or, you know, Russian cyber warfare, assassination operations in Europe. I mean, you know, right there, or election interference all over the, uh, all over the European continent. Um, the Russians never were challenged. So, so it's clear we didn't do enough in 2014, but I think at this, you know, I think that the collectively the U.S. national security establishment, including President Biden, um, you know, understood that this, this had to be, you know, challenged, um, when in the past it was not. And, and, and you're right, that was a mistake. I mean, you know, people always ask me, you know, is, is, is Vladimir Putin a war criminal? I said, well, he, well, he was before Ukraine. You know, you know it, there's, there's a move now to, to, in Congress, I think it actually might, might uh, you know, uh, uh, go forward, and of course, it's the State Department who, who who would do this of designating Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Well, you could have done this before Ukraine. You could have done it in 2014. I mean, you know what Russia has done, kind of globally, um, uh, you know, is is very consistent with what they're doing now, just on a grander scale in Ukraine. So, you know, perhaps you know Biden did, um, uh, you know, kind of I don't know if you want to say mature as a leader or learn, um, but I think we did get this right now. And, uh, and, and he has been kind of a forceful presence uh, on the world stage. I mean, you know, whether you like you know, Biden or not, I think the, the general consensus is that he's been pretty good um, when it comes to Ukraine. Sure, and, and you know, and, and that's that that is a Russian talking point. Um, but it's also it's, it's also you know, you see some U.S. Ac academics and others, kind of kind of talking about that a as well. And you know, my response to that would be that this has nothing to do with with NATO at all. Um, you know, Vladimir Putin. It's interesting if you if you hear him talk about Ukraine over the years, he doesn't believe Ukraine's a country. Um, he doesn't believe Ukraine is a separate people. I mean, he's, we're talking about, you know, Ukraine is part of greater Russia that goes back, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 hundreds or uh, if not more, more years. Um, but ultimately, to me, the invasion was, was not about fear of, NATO, uh, of, of Ukraine joining NATO because it was never going to happen. No one ever thought this was going to happen. Um, there were partnership agreements with the EU, but, but Ukraine was no, no, not anywhere near, you know, adhering to the conditions. This was Vladimir Putin fearing a democratic country on his doorstep that would threaten what he has created in, in Russia, and he's kind of taken Russia downhill to this kind of crazy, you know, autocratic kleptocracy. And so, so ultimately, to me, it's not fear of NATO. It's more fear of a democratic country that is thriving. Um, you know, kind of su it, it, Ukraine is part of Europe, um, you know, uh, uh, but, but there, there's no threat from Ukraine to anything in Russia. So you know, that, would, that would be my response on that. He is, he is terrified of, of, you know, of kind of the Ukrainian de democratic experiment actually working. Yep. So, so, you know, again, this is just, this is my view. Um, uh, but I think he saw, uh, well, a couple things. One is um, Vladimir Putin, because we did nothing for so long, really did see the West as weak. 
Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to get political one way or the other, but under the Trump administration, you know, there was, there was, there was very little support, in, in, you know, from President Trump for NATO. So the alliance was weakening. Um, uh, and, and again, Putin also saw, uh, uh, you know, you know in, in his view, NATO becoming more irrelevant. Um, and certainly anything that he ever did w was left unchallenged. Um, uh, combine that with kind of his, his historic grievances and his belief that Ukraine is not a country, um, uh, his fear of Ukrainian democracy, and then throw on top of this, and this is a really important point, throw on top of this a, a Russian intelligence service that massively bungled this, that really was telling Putin that you could probably take U Kiev in a couple days because really the Ukrainian people are, are with you. Um, you know, the, and this is why, you, of course, you saw the purges of what's called the Fifth Service in the FSB. The FSB is the Russian internal service, has a weird appendage that does kind of the former Soviet states. And so they're responsible for Ukraine. But you saw the purge of um, Basita. You know, he's now in jail, uh, the head of the Fifth Service. And so uh, because they got it so wrong, they were telling him that this would be easy. Um, so if kind of for all these factors, uh, you know, Putin embarked on, you know, what is, I think will go down in history as a, you know, wildly, um, you know, mistaken uh, uh, invasion. You, you mentioned that NATO, right? The Trump NATO side, NATO European Right. Um, is that NATO is actually played any role in um, conflict? I don't think it has anything uh, to do with whatever, 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 what any, any U.S. leader who is, uh, 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 who is in power? Um, I think um, you know. You know. Uh, ultimately, uh, this was. Uh, I, I, it was. It was a decision. You know, from everything that I hear, uh, I've heard and read, that was not even widely shared within the Russian government. Um, you saw this amazing, you know, National Security Council meeting, the Russian National Security Council meeting, where Sergei uh, Nurishkin, um, who is the who is the head of the SVR, that's the Russian External Service, was kind of dressed down by by Putin. Um, that was extraordinary. You know, these are. The, Weird things that like we always watch, um, uh, and so so Putin is almost making these decisions on his own. Um, but I, I don't think it had any different. It, it, it had any. It would have made any uh, difference. You know. Now you can have a long discussion, um, and again, it gets a little political. And do we think President a, a President Trump would have responded like Biden um, uh, has? I, I personally don't think so. Um, uh, but ultimately, I think you know Putin was uh, you know was going to do this. Uh, you know, regardless of who's in power. So sorry. So your question is: is, is What do you see as a possibility of those countries that we just oh, gotcha. talked about coming more toward? Oh, <laughs> right. Not democracy, yeah. But at least coming into a freedom of action, uh, letting people have an opportunity. Well, no, no, I gotcha. I, I think the only country they are listed that has any kind of semblance of hope would be Iraq. Um, where, you know, uh, uh, where there is a, you know, kind of pseudo burgeoning democratic system, but certainly rife with corruption. And of course, the Iranian influence is extraordinary there. Um, Afghanistan is a total disaster um, with obviously, you know, Taliban rule again. Uh, uh, and, and Syria is, you know, before Ukraine was, you know, was, was considered one of the, you know, the, the biggest humanitarian disasters um, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of, of our century. Uh, oh, so, so I mean, I, I look in my view, uh, Bashar al-Assad is a war criminal. Um, you know, there's half a million Syrians who are dead, uh, and so what he has done is abominable. You know, and so, 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 you know, when you think about it, you know, so, so, you know, the 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 international community has, um, and it's really focused in Europe, has has started prosecuting Syrians for war crimes. Um, the German courts have been good, the Dutch courts as well. Uh, but no, but in my view, you know, uh, uh, Assad is, is a war criminal, and the, and and it, it offers a very interesting lesson for us because um, what you what you see in the Middle East, and actually that you know this is my real expertise is on the Middle East. I spent you know uh, I did seven of my operational tours there. Um, 
President Assad is being welcomed back uh, into kind of the, 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 the Middle East community where Gulf states, he was, he's been honored, honored. He was, he was welcomed in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, and so, so he is being put, put, you know, brought back in an international fold. And that's a really good lesson for us when we think about Putin. And it's not the right thing to do. Um, you know, Assad is, is as bad a war criminal or worse than Putin. Um, and so we can't make that same mistake. Uh, you know, the U.S. policy towards towards Syria is not to engage with with Assad, but there are troubling signs that other Middle Eastern nations certainly are. So, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, you know, there, you know, the, there's there's you know, history. Uh, you know, the international relations is not fair sometimes. Um, I think we should judge countries, you know, and, and these leaders of these countries, you know, equally. And so, I think Assad and Putin are, are one one of the same, but. Um, a lot of other countries don't don't and, and even take a look at, at today. I mean, one of the one of the things that we have this incredible coalition in NATO um, uh, right now, uh, you know, essentially in Europe against against Vladimir Putin. But you know, uh, uh, Saudi the Saudis, um, the Emiratis, the Indian government, they haven't broken off any trade. They they have abstained in most UN votes. Um, you know, you'd think that with the atrocities being committed uh, inside Ukraine, or you'd think with the atrocities that the Assad regime committed in Syria, um, that that there would be more international outrage, and that's just not the case, and that's unfortunate. I I think so, right? Right. So, so, so it, it's a it's a great question. So again, you started to see, um, uh, you know, uh, European courts try you know, who are trying Syrians um, for for war crimes. I think in the case of Putin, uh, you know, there's been such outrage. And and again, so th we're going to we're going to go down a different tangent here. You have, and this is this is not right. Um, uh, I don't think a, a, a Syrian life is worth less than a Ukrainian life. But the fact of the matter is, you know, the, the people in Europe don't care. When Syrians are killed as much as when when a Ukrainian is killed, because it's a fellow European, and that's just a terrible part of uh, 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 of, of reality. That's not the way I feel at all. Um, but I think, whole, but but because there's so much focus now on the atrocities committed, uh, and I would argue the same types of atrocities were committed in Syria. But I think that there's going to be uh, uh, there's so much outrage um, in, in Europe, and and particularly in you know in the in the Nordic states, the you know the Baltics, um, really frontline. Uh, you know, states who, who do feel threatened by, by Russia. Um, I think there'll be a push um, for, for war crime tribunal, some kind of war crime tribunal. So what does that mean right now? It means documenting things. So the intelligence, U.S. intelligence community has been tasked by the president to document war crimes. We did this in the Balkans. Um, if you remember the, the, what was it called, PIFWICS? What was it, prisoners uh, 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 with, with some kind of war crimes uh, indictments. And, and, you know, there were Bosnian Serbs who were, you know, who were sent to The Hague. Um, uh, Bosnian Serb leaders, and so I, I think that you're, you know you're going to see a move towards us. Right now, it's documenting. I don't think there's any kind of there's no way to, to to tell how we would do this. I don't know if you know if Putin ever will be brought to justice, but but you can make life very difficult. You can make him never travel out of Russia. You know for for, for these kinds of uh, of threats, and and you know it's a, it's a gas Russia's a gas station with nukes. So if we take the gas station part out of it, um, you know uh, you, you know you make him a little more less less relevant. Um, but for now, I think you, the, you know the the ability to document war crimes is really important, and we'll kind of leave it to to the future to see what happens. As a leader, what is your process for assessing a decision? From assessing decision, what, what do you so? How do you come up with a decision? To so, I, so I, that's that's a that's a, a a pretty broad question. But so I think you know it, it, as as. You know, the one thing that I saw in my, you know, in my evolution at, at CIA is, you know, so I, I entered on duty in 1993, and that was a time where you kind of were told what to do. It was very kind of, mil you know, militaristic. It was rigid. I remember my first boss, who was a, a graduate of the Citadel and a, a former U.S. Marine. You know, it, it was it was it was at a, uh, uh, a U.S. embassy in the Middle East, and, and you know, the, the, you know, my 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 mates, you know, my 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 uh, teammates in 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 the CIA station said he has an open door policy, and I said, oh great, and I walked into his office one day, and there were, obviously he didn't, um, and I got kind of the look of death, uh, but but so so you know we've evolved since then. So what do great leaders really do in terms of decision making? It has to be that you have to have uh, uh, you know an ability to listen, um, and you know there's the old adage if you're if you're talking you ain't listening, and so it's it's the idea of being able and open uh, for input. For me. I became a much better leader 
as I as I became uh, uh, as I was more as I was in charge of more individuals, where ultimately you realize you're not the smartest person in the room, so you better listen to everybody. Um, you have to be decisive in in, in kind of in, you know in decision making. So I would ask for input. You know, I, I would be very open to all sorts of suggestions. Um, you have to kind of have that kind of inclusivity. Um, you certainly can't, if I ask you a question, or, or if I say, what do you want to, what do you think we should do, and you give me an answer, I can't say that was stupid. You know, I mean, so you, you have to be kind of polite, you have to ingest all the information. You can make a decision down the line, but, but really, but great leaders are, are really good listeners. Um, and so ultimately, that, that for me was something that I, 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 I learned. Um, uh, because, you know, it, 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 when you realize that it's not about you, when you realize that that you know, most, if, if if you are if you have that luxury that most of the people who you are managing are actually smarter than you, you're going to be a pretty good leader. Um, you just got to listen to them, you know, and, and engage them and, and, and get their input. Um, and and to me, that was that's something that I, I learned kind of later in my career, um, but proved very valuable. I wish I'd done so earlier. Sure. Oh sure. Right. So what what a great question. And, and so first of all, the answer is I, I don't know because I'm not inside government anymore. But um, we war game this stuff constantly. So so you know, and, and this is not just the Pentagon. This, so the U.S. So what we what we what we used to do, um, and I imagine what we have done recently is there will be kind of a a, a you know a formal war game which would which would uh, uh, entail the, the Russian use of a tactical nuke. How does the U.S. respond? Um, obviously, th there, you know, there, there has to be some kind of response. Um, I'm not sure, and from what I've read, uh, I don't think we respond with, you know, in kind with tactical nukes. I think it's a conventional response because there is a great fear of escalation. Um, it argues again, you know, the, so, so some people say the first time, you know, a country uses this tactical nuke, everything kind of, you know, it goes to kind of, you know, then, then this, you know, this wild nuclear exchange. I don't think that's the case, and I think that, that U.S. military leaders are, are going to try to avoid that. Um, but it is clearly something you have to plan for. You know, there's a, a friend of mine, Juliet Kayyem. She's, a, she's a kind of an expert in disaster relief. Um, she talks about what's called right of boom. And right of boom planning means, you know, you always plan for the worst. And so, there, there, you know, there is, there is, you know, U.S. doctrine for this. Um, now, obviously, we don't know about it because we don't want to, you know, message the Russians on what we're going to do. Um, but they've planned for it. And, uh, and, and, and probably the scenarios um, are pretty, pretty close to what would happen. You know, it's a, you know, so we know that, we know, so for example, um, the, the Russians, you know, have in their, in their, you know, doctrine, the use of tactical nukes. And these are, you know, these are generally, it's a cruise missile uh, strike, um, can be from, you know, aircraft or, um, or seaborne platforms or from land, uh, land platform, but it's, it would be kind of a low yield weapon. And so obviously it's going to be dropped somewhere on Ukraine. Um, and so the question then is, you know, what do we do? Um, that's, so they've planned for it. I don't know the answer. Um, but I, but there's, you know, but I, I am comforted in one sense um, that, uh, that 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 they're, they're, you know those contingency plannings are are very mature. Right. So I, I think it, it would be it would it would horrify and shock the Ukrainian government that they would sue for peace immediately. It's, it's, that's that's the answer, um, and so and you know so a couple things happen. You want to do everything possible for that for for this not to occur, um, uh, not only because it's terrible for the Ukrainians, we're going to have to suffer you know deaths and, and you know nuclear fallout, um, but also the risk of escalation. Uh, but but it's, it's clear why Putin would do this. Um, you know that would be that would be in his view probably the end of the war, which forces the Ukrainians to the negotiating table. Yeah. Which is why there's worry about you know and, and as you know it, 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 again it, it, it drives me so so I was I, you know as, as I as you know I was I was an operator so I was the one on the ground if I was still in um, you know I, I would be working with the Ukrainians on the ground and the Ukrainians don't you know the, the Ukrainian special operations or intelligence community all they want from us now is more weapons but but if but if so so from the practitioners like myself you know I want the Ukrainians to win if you're sitting in the National Security Council you are worrying about this stuff you know. 
And, and immediately when the Ukrainians sunk, um, you know, the flagship of, of, the, of the Black Sea Fleet, you know, I think there was a collective cheer uh, amongst all of us and then a collective kind of, oh shit, you know, this is totally humiliating to Putin. Um, you know, what is he going to do in response? Now, in response, he started shelling, you know, basically the entire country. Um, but, but, you know, humiliating him to, to kind of this maximum extent, there is some concern that he's going to do something kind of crazy. I think a lot of things happened. I think, so, so remember I made the comment that the East was a laboratory in watching Russian tactics. I think the Ukrainians learned a lot about electronic warfare. Um, and so, so the, the Russians, uh, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, they, they never, and they still don't have any kind of air superiority. Um, I think the, obviously the Ukrainian pilots, you know, did some, some heroic stuff, but I think on the electronic warfare spectrum, there was a lot of things done. Uh, and again, that's from eight years of watching the Russians. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and that, that made a tremendous difference. Um, because you, you, have to, you have to remember, so, you know, if, if the Russians did have, uh, uh, you know, dominance over the skies, Ukrainians can't, can't fly drones. Um, you know, and those, you know, especially the Turkish drones have been incredibly effective. Uh, and so, you know, and again, I, you know, I, I think that there's going to be some incredible stories that come out in the public over the next several years on, on you know, how kind of innovative the Ukrainians, uh, you know, were. Um, you know, not only taking, you know, uh, uh, you know, sinking, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the Russian cruiser, but, but really in the, in, the, uh, in the electronic warfare spectrum. That's just my, my sense. There is, uh, he's made it very, you know, very clear there's no one behind him. I mean, every autocrat never wants to have a successor in the waiting. Um, so, you know, again, I, I would have to, you know, talk to the kind of the Russian leadership analysts on this, but um, I don't think there's anyone waiting in the wings whatsoever, but the, every autocrat makes sure that's the case. That, that's kind of a classic, a classic move. Um, any, anyone who would ever threaten him would have been purged. Uh, so, so you remember, nu uh, Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons, and so, and I think that you know, so, so, okay, so, so I, I hear what you're saying here. The, the the worst lesson of this conflict is going to be that anyone anyone who's a nuclear power has some tremendous leverage. So I think those who are involved in the kind of the counter uh, counter proliferation field are are quite worried now. Um, you know, if if I was the Saudis or the Emiratis, I'd be racing to get a nuclear weapon because of the Iranians. Um, and, and so, so, you know, again, Russia is a gas station with nukes. Um, if Russia did not have nuclear weapons, NATO would have overwhelmed and kicked out the Russians in about four days. I, I, so I have, I've, you know, one of my good friends is an Air Force pilot. Um, and, and as he was watching the, the events unfold, and, you know, forget the escalatory part of this, he said, you know, a, a squadron of F-22s and F-35s could go in there within, within a week, and they'd, they'd have, they would decimate the entire Russian Air Force and Russian air defenses. Um, but Russia has nukes. So what does that teach the world? That obtaining a nuclear weapon is a very smart move, uh, you know, uh, strategically. Um, so I think a lot of people are concerned about that. Sure. Oh, sure, right. Even if they got the Ukraine, if they captured Ukraine, it's still going to be a big fallout. 
So Russia is still as a rich country. I mean, you know, with their with their reserves. I mean, I can't remember the exact figure. So, you know, I think that that over time it certainly bleeds. You know, the Russian treasury. I think in the short term, Vladimir Putin made the made the assessment that he could afford it. Um, I'm not as I, I'm not as as focused on how much it costs the Russian military. It's more so that how many Russians get sent home in body bags. And you know, I, I've gone on, and it sounds gruesome on this, but you know that that I've said this. You know, and, and every TV network and, and every, you know, every, every piece of print media, what Putin cares about most is that, is, is, Russian, you know, is, is dead Russian boys coming home. Um, because at some point, you know, for example, with a, uh, you know, whether you, you lose a, a cruiser um, or you know, with the casualty numbers now are what, 10 to 20,000 Russians, um, people start noticing back home. Um, and so I think that's, the, that's kind of the biggest metric is going to be uh, uh, you know, the, the catastrophic losses uh, in terms of human losses. Um, and because that's, that just can't be, be ignored. Now, one of the really interesting things we didn't touch on it tonight is, you know, and, and you, can, you can take some exception to political polling in Russia. Obviously, it's an autocratic country, but there are some independent pollsters, and it's been interesting is that actually Putin's popularity seems to have increased uh, inside Russia. And, and I think that, um, you know, to the, to the kind of the, to, to the layperson, that doesn't make much sense, but, you know, understanding Russians, you know, they're, they're certainly rallying around the flag. They, they have this propensity to kind of, you know, to suffer. Um, clearly, you know, they're, they're, what happened in World War II um, is fresh in, it's still fresh in their minds. Um, but it also, to me, is interesting because, you know, it, it, you know it's, it's a reflection, of course, I think uh, that it's, a, it's still, you know, it's a, it's a closed society, but it's also there's a demographic uh, uh, piece of this, too, that older Russians seem to be supporting Putin, younger Russians not so much. There's over 300,000 kind of young Russian technocrats who have left already. Um, but kind of that, that, that you know, again, there's the, the, what we want to see in the West, what ins would inspire all of us is to see tens of thousands of Russians on the street. Um, that doesn't seem to be happening. What I think will happen is uh, when, you know, moms and grandmoms and dads, when, they're, when their boys don't come home, um, they start getting angry. And they start getting angry at, 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 you know, at the Russian military for incompetence and certainly getting angry at, at, at Putin. Um, uh, because it's just more of that on that personal level. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I think I, I mentioned it before. I mean, I think there's been a lot that's happened that we just don't know about in terms of cyber. Um, I think you know, Cyber Command uh, and the National Security Agency have, have, have probably done a great deal both to help the Ukrainians, um, and, but you know, it, and, and you know, it, it's certainly kind of the defensive posture we have. Uh, <clears throat> um, the, the way sometimes, though, I, I look, you know. Uh, uh, I, I think that, that you know, uh, again, these kind of things are so compartmented, you know, we're not going to find out for, for some time. But the fact we haven't been hit by Russian cyber attacks and the Ukrainians haven't either. I mean, there's been some, but not in this grand scale. I think that's a, a reflection of, of a lot of good work that's been done behind the scenes. Yeah. Sure. So you know, so look, it's a, you know the, the Chinese are proving difficult, but I think President Xi, I think in the end, you know, Russia is now turned into a client state of China, and of course, that that just that statement would drive you know Putin crazy. Um, but in essence, you know, uh, th this war does not serve China's interests, um, and certainly if if Russia employed a tactical nuclear weapon, it would not. Um, you know, I think there were some some certainly some some threats are the wrong word, but some requests made from the U.S. government to, ch to China not to resupply the Russian military. Um, it was, you know, apparently with some mixed results, but, but probably more good rather than bad. Um, but ultimately, I think that you know, China wants this to end because, again, it's, you know, this, this is not uh, good for the world economy. Um, and, and, you know, with, uh, with you know, China now becoming more responsible for, in essence, another, nor you know, another North Korea, another pariah state. Um, you know, one of the things I think it will be, uh, you know, interesting down the line is as, you know, a, 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 if the stalemate continues um, and Ukrainians keep kind of you know, offering to resist, will we see China, you know, taking more of a neutral tone in, in international fora like, like the UN? Um, you know, how much will they, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know veto resolutions rather than abstain? Um, these are things that I think are going to be really telling. And that, that, that's how we're going to get a sense of when the Chinese leadership has just had about enough of this. Sure. 
It's all about trade. It, it, you know, to me, it's, it, first of all, it's a historic relationship. Um, you know, India and Russia, you know, it's, the militaries have historically been close. Um, I think a lot of us are disappointed uh, in India's, you know, attitude now, particularly when the United States government has, has tilted so far, you know, towards kind of India's camp, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, because um, we had enough of Pakistan after, you know, after the, the Pakistan government support for the, for, in essence, for the Taliban. Um, uh, but so I think there's been some, uh, some disappointment on that, but it's, it's pure and simply has to do with, you know, the, the, the kind of the strong military and economic ties um, between, between India and Russia. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's clearly something that the U.S. government is working on. Um, there was, uh, you know, there was just a high-level delegation, I think, in, in, in Delhi um, on this. Um, you know, U.S. and India are really natural allies. Uh, and so I think there's some, dis it was clearly there's disappointment within the administration on this. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but, and again, but it's also a reflection that, that you know, we, we talk, the international community is not united. Um, against Russia. The, the, Europe is united against uh, Russia, but the international community, India, Brazil, um, or the Gulf Arab states are not. And, and I think that's, that, that's disappointing to, to a lot of us, but that's just reality. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you.